Mm -hmm. Now we pause while I learn to computer for five minutes. <laughs> I don't even have a demo and the demo gods are fucking me. <laughs> <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Thanks for showing up. <laughs> I was here an hour ago. <laughs> I get to call the radio. We can't find virus. So you're telling me that the fact that the staff can't find the people who are already in the room is somehow my fault. Oh, okay. Uh, careful what you wish for. All right, well, I was going to set this up so I could actually have speaker notes, but, you know, how do I, how do I computer? So, all right, fuck it, I'll do it live. Um, all right, so um, this, uh, I guess two apologies. Uh, the first apology is that um, technically I gave part of this talk before. Um, a friend of mine uh, got involved in a conference called Shellcon IO in LA, where I live, and um, they were like, please come up with something. Like, we're trying to get this like con off the ground. And I was like, well, okay, I'll, I'll try to do a thing. And um, I was like, look, I, I have this tendency of going really short on my presentations because I talk too fast and I get super freaked out that I'm talking to a room full of people that are smarter than me. You know, case not accepted. Um, and uh, you know, like, I know you guys only want hour slots, but can you please give me a 15 minute slot? So they did. And then I started writing content. And 140 slides later, I was like, fuck. <laughs> so I tried mercilessly to go through all of them like crazy fast um, and failed miserably. So I was like, okay, well, I'll, you know, I'll give this talk one more time someplace where it's going to be recorded and accessible and I'll actually get through all the content. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing is um, if you, uh, they, they posted the video of that like a couple days ago or coach they did. Um, and if you go look at that presentation, you'll notice all the pictures are completely different. Um, that is because, uh, my work is a crazy place, and even though that this has nothing to do with anything that I have ever done for them, and I'm speaking under an alias, they demanded that I get my talk approved, and the approval process meant that all of my images had to be Creative Commons. <laughs> so there's some weird, like, women laughing with salad type shit. Uh, sorry, like, it was that or no talk. <laughs> um, Okay, so pages of a sword maker's notebook. So this talk is basically how to write malware. Now, when I say that, I don't mean like, here's how an exploit works and that kind of thing. What I mean is, um, practically in the real world, writing stuff that sits on devices and gathers intelligence for a long period of time uh, is an order of magnitude more difficult for the individual than it is for large, well-funded organizations, right? I mean. Like, it's fun to read about stuff like shadow brokers in the news, but at the end of the day, it's not fucking practical for you to know what exactly what hardware or microcontroller you're going to be able to hide on in your target unless you are a nation state. It's just fucking not, right? Like, I don't have a team of people that work for me. And if I had the money to pay them, I wouldn't be hacking shit. I'd be on a beach someplace. Fuck you guys. Um, <laughs> So uh, a lot of the stuff in this talk in terms of the how-to is on how to make things practical, how to make them easy, how to make them scalable, how to have one code base that works on all of your targets rather than to have to tweak shit every damn time and blah, 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 blah. Um, okay, so first, how do we get there, right? And this is just a quick kind of like general overview on you know, how, how we're getting to the box because otherwise I would talk about a bunch of malware and people would be like, well, how do you get it there? Uh, okay, so uh, you know, we're evil bad person. And we want to hack thing, place, organization, could be nonprofit, could be corporate, could be a bunch of terrorists, who, who cares? Um, at the end of the day, from an information perspective, um, organizations are just people. That's really all they are. I mean, yeah, there's, there's attaches of intangible things that are attached to them, but really when we're talking about what's important, it's the people, right? And people from a cyber perspective are just devices, that's all they are, right? They are their stuff, they are their tablets, their phones, their PCs, their Laptops, their you know, desktops, their 
you know, IoT crap in their house. Like that's what people are. They are a collection of data. So when we talk about a kill chain that's going to get us to what we want, we're talking about how do we get on the devices of the people that make up the organization that we want, and how do we aggregate for as long as possible without getting caught. So obviously, easy mode vector phishing, right? That's that's what everybody does to, to get on when they don't they don't want to write exploits because they're lazy. I mean, I'm lazy. Um, so phishing has pros and cons. Uh, on the upside, phishing is really easy. Uh, you get a mul you get a bunch of shots at the target, right? Like you can pretty much fish somebody forever, and I mean they can adapt to your attacks, kind of like the Borg. But like, there's always going to be a new thing, right? Um, nobody's immune to phishing. We all know that, right? We're all humans, um, and y you don't. The like, phishing is generally technically unsophisticated. I mean, I'm not saying you know that you know there's no talent involved in doing social engineering. I'm just saying the talent that's involved in doing it is different than you know needing to know how to rebuild a file header from a you know blob of hex, right? Um, also, generally, anytime you succeed at phishing, you get whatever access the person you fished has, which from an intelligence gathering perspective is usually enough, right? Like, you don't need to get root on somebody's laptop if you have, for example, their browser. Have your life. Fuck root. Uh, on the downside, phishing's really loud, right? Like, you, you, you're not going to fish somebody without creating some level of noise, and that means there is a non-zero chance you'll get caught. Um, it's really hard to scrub the evidence of any uh, uh, social engineering attack, successful or not. Um, obviously, that changes with spear phishing versus net phishing, um, uh, which makes it generally higher risk. Um, and generally, if any part of your fish gets seen, uh, it's going to get investigated, right? It's not like, I mean, programs fail all the time. Like, if you've got some super elite, gnarly O'Day, and you know you pop somebody via some RCE thing, and it fails mercilessly, and B-sides their box, at the end of the day, computers suck, so what are most people going to do? Oh, my box restarted. Reboot it. Like, really? Most people, it, you know, you get like two or three times until they're like, uh, every time I run this program, it reboots, right? Then they're going to investigate it. Phishing, you get one weird email, like, email work. Oh, my God. People are going to look. All right, so I waste fish. Uh, office docs are like the new thing that, like, yeah. Go fish people with office docs. Um, if you're going to fish people with office docs, uh, go find uh, Laughing Mantis's Twitter and like try very, very hard to buy him lots of alcohol and like perform sexual favors for him uh, because he has this crazy awesome tool that is like all of the last like 20 years of like VB gnarly crap into one tool that's like point and click a button and like make the equivalent of Meterpreter on crack for an office document. Unfortunately, he hasn't released it yet, but he is like, trust me, he is working furiously to make it so. Um, in general, uh, hiding uh, just, just one method to hide stuff inside a docx file, um, that, this is pretty much it. Like you, you, you go to the script button and you type that and you fill payload with like evil crap. Um, it's not exactly advanced. This is an example of one um, with the payload removed, uh, obviously, because calc.exe, uh, that uh, me and uh, this is, I think, in the room someplace, but this is, this is something we worked on uh, together. Um, this is just an example, like, at some point these slides are going to get published, and when they are, like, you can copy and paste this into a Word document and it'll work. Like, all the examples that are here, like, you don't have to know how they work, <laughs> if you trust me. <laughs> um, but, you know, you copy them and paste them into a terminal and they work. Uh, the whole point of this talk was to be extremely practical. Um, uh, props to these guys. I was asking questions on Twitter about this new DD Auto thing, which is basically uh, turns out the same thing, the, the same blob of code in Office that lets you write an Excel macro uh, works in all of their docs. And turns out Excel macros have shit that you can run third party applications in because Microsoft decided that was a good idea. So you can put shells on that. Um, and this is pretty much like if you paste that into uh, an Excel cell, you will load calc. Um, there's a really good blog on how to do it. Um, Go read theirs. I'm not going to repeat their research. Um, so other methods of phishing. Um, I highly, and I'm going to talk about this a lot um, because it's awesome and he's no longer maintaining, um, the, the guy who wrote it is no longer maintaining the, the code anymore, but there's more than enough there for anybody to pick it up and run with it. Um, uh, there's a utility called uh, BDF proxy or backdoor factory. Um, and that is pretty much the best way to backdoor a binary file. Um, well, I'll talk about how it works later um, in different contexts, but basically you give it a payload and you give it a file and you say, hide this thing in that thing and it works. It's fucking magic. Um, so in terms of doing fake updates, the same guy has some more recent research about a utility called uh, SigThief, which basically just steals signatures, right? So you can like steal a Windows SIG from one signed binary to another. Um, so that plus BDF proxy means 
uh, like all of a sudden evil grade works again, right? I mean, give or take SSL, but I mean, let's face it, in a world of IoT and you know, generally internet of shit, uh, if you uh, block uh, traffic from one place to another rather than trying to man in the middle and then redirect it to a cert that's bad. Usually insecure skip verify is on because people want their stuff to work. Um, evil grade is a utility that got released a while ago which pretty much does the same thing. It just listens for network traffic, listens for things that are trying to update and then uh, back towards the update in real time but uh, BD, uh, using sig thief is a way to make that work again. Beef, I'm sure all of you are familiar with beef, you know, browser exploitation framework. Um, find some XSS, pop something in there, and then wait for somebody to go to something vulnerable. And then uh, manual packet spoofing is, um, man, I really, I was gonna drop the source when I dropped this at ShellCon, and uh, unfortunately I sold a payload that did this to somebody, and it's over a year old, and I keep telling them, hey man, it's over a year old, can I release the source now? And they're assholes and they won't let me. So I, w I was gonna release something that was gonna do manual packet spoof, but basically, um, it turns out that if you look at the packet, like, okay, if you look at the process of an update over a network, the chunk of packets that says, is there an update, tends not to change from system to system. It also turns out that uh, they tend to not look at the reply at the socket level. So what that means is that if you know exactly how an update is going to look, you can constantly broadcast packets at a target that say, here's the response to your update. And as long as they don't look too malicious, eventually, you will get the traffic handshake instead of the thing that they're trying to contact to, and you can push malicious software up the chain. This totally works. I, I'm sorry that it's like hard to explain without actual source, but whatever. Fuck that guy. <coughs> uh, where's? So, like, oh my god, I can't even tell you how many targets I've gotten by, like, watching their Twitter feed and waiting for them to complain about, like, oh, Ida's expensive, and then you send them an email from like random spam thing, 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 random Russian, also like at a 6.7 for free. <laughs> you could put like, don't run this, it will fuck your computer backwards, they will still run it, right? <laughs> Telling you it works. The other thing that does that, porn. I can't even, I like, at one point I wrote a payload that literally took people's picture and for a POC for another talk I did, which was internal, unfortunately, but it was another talk I did and I was trying to prove that like anybody can be fished and it was like very corporate so they like didn't believe me. I literally made a website that was like a, a, a JavaScript alert would pop up on the page that said if you click yes to this box your computer will literally self-destruct and behind it was a big pair of titties. 75% of the people clicked yes <laughs> out of 1,200 people, okay? Like it turns out like I don't mean to be offensive but it's the truth. It turns out like Chris Rock said everybody loves a big titty woman. Um, zero day or one day or old day. Um, I obviously prefer old day or one day because if it gets caught, people are just gonna assume, oh, it's somebody using this CVE, blah, 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 blah. O day is more like, oh man, like we've never seen this before, we're gonna investigate it and look at the payload. And that's, that's not good, right? Um, so uh, good places to hide O day to get into stuff. Um, image libraries are great, um, especially in games uh, because uh, people like games, games tend to get updated when people are playing them. And then when their popularity drops off, like super weird nerds like focus on that one game and then it stops getting patches. And so if they do get patches, they'll be like, okay, we have to have security updates for the actual game itself. But like, you know, the PNG library that loads the avatar get, <laughs> that thing's old as hell. <laughs> um, browsers obviously, but you know, those are kind of coveted. Um, but that, this tends to work on uh, like kiosk systems where like browser updates are known to break the site that they're supposed to load internally, so they tend to not get updated. That works sometimes. Um, chat applications are great. I don't know if any of you have ever looked at like the uh, fuzz outputs that people use for metrics on libpurple, but that shit is fucking awful. Um, media sharing is good. Actually, I'm surprised that there's not more published bugs for um, uh, video players because, um, well, Go fuzz M player and you'll see what I'm talking about. Um, and then obviously drivers, um, drivers get old, drivers get not updated. They're good places to use O'Day and then if they break, people just assume that their hardware's malfunctioning or there's a cable problem or something like that. I just, you know, these are bugs that people don't immediately assume like when they fail in the wild, which bugs always fail in the wild, are necessarily malicious. Physical access, obviously there's uh, evil mate attack. Um, there's the long con, you know, you get to be somebody's friend, you wait to, you know, be alone with their cell phone or something like that. Um, and then obviously wireless, which is a whole other category of stuff. Um, you know, these are just 
how, just so I said it, right? That this is these are the contexts that we're talking about in terms of ways to get in. Okay, so you've done one of the one or many of those things. We're on the box, and now we want to persist. All right. Um, so an MBR payload is uh, uh, I find surprisingly useful. A lot of AVs check it, but a lot of AVs check it badly. Um, AVs tend to check when the MBR is getting modified. Um, so a lot of times you can turn AV off for a minute, and in the time it takes to restart it, you just do your MBR thing there. Um, sometimes they will hash um, the MBR signature, but a lot of them don't hash the entire MBR because due to the way that file format, or due to the way that disk formatting works, it's kind of hard to hash just the MBR without hashing the whole disk, which in a DFIR context, yeah, you're fucked, but in a runtime context, like, that's a significant enough performance hit that I have found that most AVs tend to not do a good job. So a lot of times you can do things like um, change the pointer in uh, whatever code is in the first 512 bytes of the data to point to some other place on the hard drive and then make an MBR that runs forever, and as long as you're not in the, one of the evil sectors, it works. Um, it's really effective. Uh, it's incredibly multi-platform. Like, everything works on it. I mean, yeah, UEFI is a new thing, but everything runs in dual legacy mode these days, because what if UEFI doesn't work? And there's tons of reasons why UEFI doesn't work. We'll talk about that later. Um, and yeah, so a lot of stuff is in dual mode. So if you do stuff on an MBR, you know, uh, uh, this is also great for, like, USB sticks. Like, I can't even tell you how many times it's like, oh, I'm going to put an MBR in this USB stick that somebody only uses for data. And then they reboot their box, and as long as it comes back, they're like, well, I guess it's good. <laughs> they don't notice they've booted off a completely different disk. Um, it's also really, really, really quiet to do on Unix-based systems, because unless somebody is running SE Linux or protections that matter, um, under a default wheel user, you can DD to HD and SD asterisk, and it doesn't complain. <laughs> so you can just take, I mean, here's an example. Here's a, a Hello World uh, MBR, which uh, will just display root is only the beginning. And if you've ever been, if, if there's anybody in here who's ever competed in CCDC in the past four years, you may or may not have seen this before. <laughs> um, uh, it, it's just, it's a bootloader that will display root is only the beginning and then not do anything. So your box is basically bricked. Um, and this is how I deployed it on kids systems when I was running in CCDC. And I've, I've done this on clients. Like this, this works. Like it's not like cat to device. Turns out like nobody does shit. <coughs> um, so UEFI. Uh, so secure boot sucks. Um, mostly because None of the hardware vendors wanted to play nice with anybody else but Windows for the most part, like slightly Red Hat, but that's another story. Um, and then just like all things key-based, like Microsoft fucked it up, so now it's fucked up. Um, first of all, writing a UEFI binary is fucking easy. Like literally, this is the C template for doing it. Like do this and you now have a UEFI payload. Just put stuff in the middle that fucks with your, bu fucks with your target and there you go. Um, so in terms of UEFI functionality, God, these pictures, man. Um, <laughs> these originally were all like Archer GIFs, and they were like, no. Um, so first, um, uh, anybody uh, remember the Microsoft Domain Controller like 2008 bug, where like they implemented this feature where uh, there was a flag you could set in a GPO where it would like encrypt like a password, and then anytime anybody plugged into your network, it would send them this hash, and then you know, they didn't know their own local admin password, which was great, except apparently the right hand didn't talk to what the left hand was doing, and the original plan was to publish a way for people to cycle the seed so that the crypto wouldn't get predicted, and they never came out with that feature, and then they published the fucking seed in the help file. Oops. Um, so they basically did the same thing with UEFI, it turns out. Like, the key is totally public. Um, so you can totally sign your own images with, like, the Microsoft key. Uh, and then they had this whole policy problem where they were like, well, we don't want to immediately revoke it because how will admins, like, change their shit, like how do I hold all these keys? Um, and then when that didn't work, there were two patches, and long story short, which is a very long story, there's like a couple of blogs on it, and I didn't even bother to link them because they're just tripe. Um, they didn't work. Um, and now we have this problem where there's already a bunch of devices that it's totally unreasonable to like null out in the next 10 years that they can't revoke the key on, because when they do, nothing will work. So pretty much nine times out of 10, at least for the next 10 years, like use the old key, it'll probably work. Um, on Linux, UEFI is pretty much a joke because um, in order for UEFI to, have, to be secure, there's this, I mean, you can go Google secure boot, right? We all know what secure boot is, right? But the problem with secure boot is that in order for secure boot to work, you have to be able to take a key from your signed instance and put it into your BIOS. And it turns out that like a whole bunch of BIOSes just don't give you that functionality because they were like, that sounds hard and people might do dumb shit. We're going to not do that. 
okay, well that means if you're not using like an OS that has a UEFI signed image, like secure boot just doesn't really fucking work. Like you can click the box, but it won't check the signature. <laughs> Um, so yeah, Linux is pretty much easy mode. Um, OS X is pretty much hard mode slash impossible mode because TLDR, Apple controls all the things on the motherboard including all the microcontrollers and there's all kinds of crazy spy shit there so you fuck with it and you probably break something. Uh, so uh, daemonization persistence. So these are just like I am unboxed and now want to create orphan process, what do I do? Uh, the first method is uh, the sysv method which is the pretty standard like this is generally how you create a daemon in Linux, it's pretty much just an orphan process, right? You, you run in a user context, you detach from your shell, you fork, you do a set set, you, you know, set whatever signals you want to receive input and you fork again. At the point where you forked again that process is now orphan, it's just off living in some place. Um, you can bug it in a descript. Um, <laughs> Funny story, I wish I would have updated this uh, POC. This is just a, a hello world kind of uh, uh, in a descript as an example of places that you can hide things. Um, what's funny is uh, um, Gentoo actually, when a recent update changed uh, the, uh, I think it's UTF-8, or they changed like the format syntax that parses uh, uh, init scripts. And what's funny is that means you can take like weird Unicode words and like replace like quotes with unicorn stuff which makes functions fail so you can have like in the error function like do horrible shit and like people are reading the script and they're like oh it looks totally normal and actually it's totally backdoor and nah, it's pretty cool. <laughs> um, RC script pretty much the same thing. Um, these are I mean this is pretty much a how to of like how to write an exit script you just make that call like my malware dot whatever. Uh, it works. Um, system D services. System D. Um, this is a cool uh, trick I learned on systemd in a chat room. Uh, yeah, pretty much read the slide. Um, or you can write a cron job. Uh, and there's a bunch of interesting ways you can write cron jobs. Especially cron jobs, like it's really cool to like find a cron job that already exists that like copies backups. And you can like uh, add, like and you can append things to the backup file that make it like not parse logs that are prepended with a certain key and then everything that you do, you can prepend with that certain key and then like the logger won't log you. Yeah, that's kind of cool. Uh, persistence in user space. So on Windows pretty much use the registry. Oh my god, there's like so many places to persist on the Windows registry. It's kind of like, I kind of wonder if they didn't do it on purpose. <laughs> um, so run once, this is a registry key where you point to uh, a folder and anything in that folder when the computer is started it's going to run. Uh, boot execute happens, uh, it does uh, like control session stuff so anytime like a new user session starts which is kind of cool for like VMs and like hyper, uh, uh, high availability clusters and stuff like that. Um, user init is exactly like um, app init DLL which we'll talk to, which I think is like next, um, which is basically anytime uh, somebody logs into the system um, it will uh, go to this directory and run whatever's there. Um, notify is anytime a logged in user receives a notification, it will trigger your application. Um, you can replace explorer.exe. Yeah, it's signed, but SigThief works on explorer.exe, so just replace the shell. Fucking done. Um, start applications, these are all default shell startup stuff. You can put stuff in any of these and it'll run. Um, service locations, so Windows services, um, pretty much all like. The, the cool kid malware that's coming out of like Eastern Europe these days is all hiding as like Windows services because it's just a DLL and it, for some reason like the like the Windows PE parser that parses like the DL load doesn't check the same stuff for a service that it does for a regular PE. I, I like after I put this slide in there I thought like oh maybe I should go into why that's so but I don't have a way to do that and still maintain any semblance of time just just like TLDR do not trust anything Microsoft says about how a PE is constructed. There's one function after NTDLR that I will probably get sued if I say exactly what the name of the function is but it's there, it's just not documented. So like open window bug, <laughs> break on DL load, look for the function that's not documented and go read that shit in IDA. It turns out the way it works is not the way they say it works at all. <laughs> um, so if you're writing a Windows service pretty much like type this in a text editor and compile it and there you go. Um, not hard. 
Uh, background services. Background services are great. They're just like regular services, but they run in the background. Um, they tend to get less resources by default unless they're configured otherwise, but that can be to your advantage because you can use the changing resource pool as a key to find out what else is happening to the system, even if you don't have access to other processes. Uh, it's kind of cool. Like I've done this before where like I, uh, I did a gig um, where we popped a, a, a render farm and the controller for the render, for the render farm was, in, was like an old like Windows 98 box because they were like afraid to update it. Kind of stupid. Um, but um, we got a super unprivileged user account and long story short, it became very useful to know when the render farm was in use. And so what we did is look at system resources on the controller and ran a background resource. And we said, how many resources do we have to run this background service and requested just enough to be like a standard service. And when Windows would try to squash it, we'd be like, ah, it's running. Yeah, stuff like that's cool. Um, browser helper DRLs. Oh, so um, there's a payload I have for this that if you buy me enough beers tonight, I might give it to you because I have it with me. And I haven't technically sold it yet, but I'm assuming it's going to be worth money, which is why I didn't disclose it. Uh, so browser Apple DLLs is exactly what it sounds like. You take a DLL, you stick it in a folder, you point your you know, reg key at it, and anytime like a browser gets loaded on your system, it will be like, oh, you need this DLL to also be loaded for some bullshit plugin. You see where this is going. Uh, so. It's going to take more than one. I'm a professional. <laughs> also, advertising your bid in front of a bunch of other people is not good OPSEC. You know. <laughs> Have you people learned nothing from Mount Gox? Come on. <laughs> um, anyway, um, I guess like to be determined at some point depending on beer. Um, hypothetically, if one had a shared object that called an existing plugin, even though you didn't write the plugin in a given browser and got loaded when the browser was there, it might have access to browser memory. So hypothetically, if one took, say, a snapshot of, oh, I don't know, Internet Explorer, when it had, oh, I don't know, LastPass loaded, <laughs> that may or may not work. Um, App init DLL, uh, anytime uh, any application loads system 32, it will also load your DLL, which is super good if you're using exploits that ROP because you can change the thing that it ROPs to to be shorter. Um, app cert DLLs, I, oh man, see this is in my speaker notes and I'm trying to remember, this is like, it's kind of the same thing as app init DLL, but it happens like anytime anybody logs in or something like, oh, anytime any, uh, anything creates a user session manager. Oh, you know what? And and my, okay, now I remember. Um, there are four or five uh, Windows API calls specifically that if those API calls happen, then this, uh, any, any DLL that you have in this area gets loaded. And I think one of them is like create process. So, you know, shady. Um, file associations, this is a fun one. Uh, you can like, it's, it's kind of cool to get on targets and like change like the thing that loads a doc file to a thing that sends you the doc file first <laughs> or like, you pop a web developer box and like, you know, before they run git, it runs like send me your git creds first. Or another one I've done, um, which um, they actually got mad at us for because we broke some shit, was um, uh, anytime you specifically did git, it would uh, parse the command that was used and find out if it was a git commit. And if it was a git commit because we knew we were going after web developers, it would prepend our web shell to their code. <laughs> <laughs> it turned out to be really bad because like I assumed like oh we'll do this once and then we'll have all these shells and unfortunately they did it like a whole bunch until they found it and they were like oh well give us a range of like you know g give us the git blame that we can go trace the shell in and that was like I don't know like <laughs> whenever you ran it on your box last and they were like fuck yeah. Um, yeah if you don't know what SVC host is like I don't know google it it's the way that Windows runs services you can change where it points to, you can backdoor the executable itself and steal signatures because um, there's actually some public documentation on using SIG Stealer on that. Eh, it's a thing. Um, if you want to see an example of this, uh, of this kind of stuff of like hiding a, a DLL as a service in real life, uh, Silence actually has a really good blog post on um, some malware. I think they speculated that it's Russian, but pff, attribution, right? Um, uh, it's it's a really good breakdown on uh, some malware they found in the wild that does this, and it's just it's just cool. It's you know it's it's um, it's a good overview of everything I just explained, right? It's like an instance of copying to a Windows service. It's an instance of setting a register key to make sure the Windows service is loaded. It's a background service. It's just, you know, it's cool. It's a good example. Um, WMI. So WMI. Um, 
Originally, uh, I kind of shied away from because I'm like, well, that's super obvious and leaves a bunch of logs and like this is cool on pen tests, but like I wouldn't use this in the real world. Especially because I was like, well, how do you, how do you make WMI commands that survive reboots? Ha! Turns out you can. <laughs> so um, it turns out when you set a scheduled task as WMI, if the scheduled task is supposed to trigger the following day, like at least one day in the future, and you reboot the computer, it comes back only for that day. So if you have a WMI command that constantly does some shady shit, adds a scheduled task, waits for a reboot, then comes back, adds a scheduled task, does some shady, it works! <laughs> and it's fileless, so win. <laughs> um, yeah, the guy who, uh, this is the, the first time I saw it wide-banded, so, you know, previous research, like, go read his talk, it's cool stuff. Um, and this was how I found out that that worked. Because I asked Twitter, I was like, hey, you can't, you can't make this persist, right? <laughs> and then I tried it, and it worked. <laughs> um, so on disk persistence. So I know like, all the pen testers just started rolling their eyes because like, oh, man, like, I, I keep my stuff off disk. Yeah, OK, that's cool on a gig, like, when, you're, when you have to be polite and like, you, know, you have to be generally you know, respectful of the environment you're in. In the real world, when you want to stay on a box for a year, you're getting on fucking disk. Deal with it. <laughs> like, boxes reboot, people drop them, kids spill shit on them. Like, trust me about that one. <laughs> That's a thing. <laughs> oh my God, five month olds and phones. Um, but yeah, you're, you're going to get on disk. It's a thing. Um, so, shortcut hijacking. Uh, this is the, you know, you change this. You know, we've all done like the Chrome incognito hack. Well, yeah, you can you know, go point to my other thing backdoor shortcuts. Um, people tend to not check the shortcuts. It tends to work. Obviously, AV tends to not give a shit. So while it seems obvious, like a lot of this stuff that we're going to talk about in this section, especially the disk write stuff, seems really like, oh my god, that's dumb and something I'll totally see that. Yeah, you totally see that if you're looking for it. But realistically, like people aren't looking. Like as long as you're smart enough not to make noise, like this stuff works for years and years and years and years. And then by the time you get caught, you've already got all the information you want. So be practical, right? Like we're, we're, we're not the NSA. We don't have that kind of budget. Like, Fucking use baseball bats. <laughs> um, DLL hijack. Uh, so these, this is actually the order in which the DLLs are looked for on a Windows system. This is true even all the way up to Windows 10. Um, so you know, in, in this context, like this is the one that's going to get loaded. So the others are going to get ignored. Um, yes, Windows likes to sign DLLs, but Windows doesn't like to check that the DLLs are signed if the application itself is not signed. So, for example, <coughs> Discord. Uh, if one uh, hid a copy of a DLL that exists somewhere else on the system and stuck it in the same program directory, oh, look, it works. Um, backdooring the PE. So this is where we're going to talk about backdoor factory. So this is how backdoor factory works. In this case, we're talking about PE files, um, but it works on any binary file. And actually, uh, I think before he stopped maintaining the code, he actually included some web formats too. And it, the code is generally well documented. The entire thing is in Python. I've already taken pieces of it and put it into small, completely autonomous systems. Like, it's just a cool trick. So uh, the way backdoor factory works is it looks for code caves. A code cave is anywhere in a binary in assembly where you have some stuff, some stuff, some stuff, jump to a place with no real reference on where we are in the stack. Some stuff happens, like, oh, I don't know, a function call, and then it returns, right? And pop, pop, right, we're back. Well, it turns out that if you make jump to some stuff go to my code, it just works, right? And so code caves are pretty much a given in pretty much any given binary. And other than signatures, like, either hashing the file or checking the signature of the code section, nothing's going to find it. And there are so many ways around the code section stuff. I don't know why um, that all the modern operating systems that are doing code signature checking aren't also just hashing the goddamn file. Because while you can do hash collisions, it's monumentally more difficult um, to, take the to take the time uh, to do a hash collision on a base um, payload injected binary. But for some reason, they're all stuck on this code injection thing, and the code injection shit doesn't fucking work because it's just one section of the binary, so just pick another section. Um, anyway, so yeah, you, you pick your other place, you jump, you change where the jump jumps to, and then you jump back to the original code, and yeah, that's, that's how you do it. Um, that's, the, that's the repo for where Bacter Factory is. Uh, yeah, highly recommend you check it out. Um, and this is just, um, like, this is kind of like one tweet from, like, like the modern way of how you would use it, right? Like this is like you use, sig you know, you use uh, backdoor factor, you use sig thief to steal your signature, you backdoor an exe, and then um, that middle link is just a PDF um, from that company that uh, has a lot of different ways on uh, um, uh, bypassing application whitelisting, because, I mean, you know, 
you get to that point and game over, right? Uh, anyway, so in user, uh, in Linux, um, so LD preload, this is an example of a pretty good uh, LD preload that's written in Go. I do everything in Go because I like having one code base that works on every platform in the world. Um, yes, the binaries are huge, and it's 2018. Nobody gives a shit. Like, <laughs> I mean, uh, I think I plan to ask this. Like, if you're a blue teamer in this room, raise your hand. Really? Two? Oh, I don't believe you. Good OPSEC. Um, okay, <laughs> so if you're a blue teamer, think to yourself whether or not seeing a file larger than, say, 50 megabits or 50 megabytes on a file by itself is enough to trigger an incident response. Yeah, somebody had the balls to say, hell no, right? Well, 50 megs is a lot of fucking room. <laughs> I can put a lot of bad shit in 50 megs, right? Even in Go, so yeah, this is why like multi-platform RINs fuck size. Um, anyway, here's an example of a preload backdoor. Here's an example of a backdoor kernel module. These are things that I just decided to link rather than include in my slides and necessarily explain how they work because, again, the goal of this talk is to be practical and other people have already done the work. I'm just going to reference the previous stuff. I mean, this is what I did. Like, I go and Google their state and then modify it because it's fast and because it's quick. Um, replacing the kernel. <laughs> people think this doesn't work. I've done this on like five different engagements completely successfully. So it turns out, um, most of the time, uh, so you can, okay, so even, even a kernel that's generally protected, a hash collision offline is a lot easier to do, right? Um, uh, kconfig is not, I think it's deprecated in modern Linux, but everybody leaves it on because um, there are Red Hat variants, or there are RPM system-based variants that kind of need it, and so nobody wants to turn it off. And what's awesome is that if you, ha if you have it, aside from incompatibilities from modules, you can pop a box and then view the kernel config and then go offline and build, just, you know, based on the version number, build their kernel and then hide shit in it in some weird place, do your hash collision offline and then just replace the kernel file. Totally works. If it's UEFI, even better because it's only one file. <coughs> uh, <coughs> excuse me. I'm going to pour myself some water. I'm sitting here dying. Really? I mean, sure. No promises. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> All right. Syscall hijacking. So syscall hijacking is one of the ways you can modify a kernel. It's basically the same thing as looking for a code cave, only you find a pointer to a syscall and you move it to evil syscall and then stick evil syscall somewhere in a segment in an elf. Pretty much works. How do you do that? Well, this is like the super like TLDR version. Uh, that's kind of what an elf looks like. Um, you take one of these sections, you add it, you, you know, you make like my evil section, you change your section header table to, you know, point to, to include your thing, you change the header to include the basic size, and then you change the syscall. If uh, you try to do this, at, uh, you know, if you're playing along at home uh, and you try to do this and your format doesn't look like an elf, that's because it's a compressed thing called a BZ image, and this is what that looks like. So you basically just take this chunk of the code out, and then it's a standard elf, and you can modify it, and yeah. Uh, th these are PAM backdoors, and uh, <laughs> this will tell you, um, we've had a lot of uh, positive experiences <laughs> with patching PAM, because PAM is kind of like LDAP, like nobody wants to touch it because it's too weird and voodoo-y. <laughs> um, We've, um, I think the coolest thing I've ever seen posted for a PAM patch is uh, a, a guy uh, on like a, it was like a CCDC Nationals, and um, he wrote this thing where anytime anybody would change the password, PAM would send it to him over a really weird covert channel. <laughs> so he like had a website open that was just like his C2, and you'd just see it spit out passwords and system names. It's fucking awesome. <laughs> Set you at root. <clears throat> uh, this is... Uh, a GitHub that links to a really, really, really easy set UID root um, example. I think it uses LS or, or ping, I think. I think it uses ping. Um, and there's a blog post linked that is a really good primer on, it, it's like, you know, why you can never trust a box once it's been popped and you absolutely have to wipe it. And it's because set UID root is pretty much impossible to, like, practically secure around, so nobody does. Um, Elf backdoor, we've already talked about this in nauseam. Um, OS X. So this is pretty much the Apple version of, LD preload, um, and 
like plus plus everything on Apple, like nobody runs antivirus on Apple. So like, oh my God, everything works. <laughs> and also like, you know, Apple is very committed to the user experience and making sure that everybody's system is parity, which is a nice way of saying your payload will always work because there's like no deviation of weirdness in their environment. Yay. <laughs> um, so uh, a popular complaint about popping Apple systems is SIP, which is basically the thing in OS X that makes you not able to write to like slash applications. Um, but that's only true if you're not in an application. So find one local bug. <laughs> and these are the only directories it works on. And if you know anything about basic Unix, like, yeah, there's a lot other directories that get used in normal space that are fucked, so just don't hide your shit there. It'll never care. Um, you can write a kernel module. Yes, Apple has a kernel. Yes, it has loadable modules. They call them K extensions instead of modules because fancy. Um, and yeah, again, no antivirus, so you know, add what you want. Uh, nobody's looking. Uh, Mako is a supported binary type of backdoor factory, so again, like really, it's like backdoor factory is this shit. Um, once HD is like, Apple kind of has like five or six little like wannabe bullshit crons kind of like they're like, you know, here's a script and run it at a certain time when a thing happens. And for some reason, like they keep coming out with systems like this and then they decide, oh, we don't like it. Let's go make another one. But they don't get rid of the old one. So like launch HD is, is one of them. Like you, know, you can launch agents anytime the system boots. Um, here's an example of a launch HD script. It's pretty straightforward. It's XML. So it's easy to hide. It's easy to transmit. This is just... You know, again, I designed this stuff so that you could paste it in the file and run it, and then immediately fill the hello world part out with your bad evil. Um, uh, very similar to the system D uh, hack I found. This is a, a because by default, um, launch HD will start like a terminal window, which is a little weird because that doesn't happen on Apple's, but this will make that not happen. Yay. Um, you can write a login hook, which is documented on Apple's website. So why the fuck would I explain it? Like, go to the RTFM. <laughs> um, constant process migration. So this is another, like, if I had another hour, I would explain the details. But basically, long story short, uh, lack of AV on OS X generally means that process migration is not um, monitored as closely as it is on either well-secured Linux systems or recently, uh, believe it or not, like Windows systems. Like Windows 10 is pretty like, you know, run default migrate and Metasploit, it gets angry. <laughs> like, like nuke the box blue screen angry unless you like, you know, massage it a little bit. Apple doesn't care. Um, and what's great about Apple is that nobody ever turns the machines off, right? Because they have awesome battery life and they just like close them and they suspend. And when they suspend, the process context stays. So you can just have processes that like, you jump into the suspend process and when we get suspended, okay, now jump back into the thing. Yeah, yeah. Do that. No files. Totally works. Um, credential access, you know, these are just, you know, typical methods of maintaining persistence. Uh, phone backup files. I find this one often overlooked. So we're a lot of security people, and security people are usually pretty good about password locking their uh, phone backups, just because we do it rarely enough that like that's the piece of OPSEC we remember. Um, but normal people don't. Um, and this works really, really, really good on Android phones. You can do shit like find the Android backup, add my evil APK to the thing, and then um, next time they plug the phone in, you uh, write a driver hook that adds uh, slash dev random to whatever gets spit over the USB port. And so the phone doesn't brick, it just breaks and goes, I need a new image. And then they load the image from backup, which is totally backdoored. And now you have persistence, in some cases, that syncs to implants you may or may not have on the original host system, but now they're on the phone. Also, now you have um, all the uh, wireless keys, so you can kind of know where they've been, you know all the Wi-Fi passwords that they have, you can use the Wi-Fi passwords to access systems even if they're offline, which is great for air gaps. Um, yeah, phone backup files I find overlooked, but don't overlook them. Intel gathering. So this is like, okay, like, fuck persistence, fuck access, and this is pretty much the last chunk of the talk is like, you know, how... What is an extremely practical, easy to maintain and encode way to like gather data on target without writing a whole shit ton of like manual driver munging code? And then at the end, we'll talk about like some kind of novel packing techniques that I've developed slash come across slash whatever. Um, so uh, this is a, a basic, like if I'm gonna write a, a keylogger on Windows, like here you go, here's your C primer. Um, this looks like pseudocode, it's actually not, it's just C with a, with a, with a snippet. Um, pretty much, 
Um, Windows has an API call called get async key state, um, and you loop over that for every key, which sounds insufficient as shit, and you know what? Every single shell that's like publicly available on the internet does it this way. This is the way Empire does it, this is the way Metasploit does it, this is the way fucking Powersploit does it, like everybody does it this way. Yes, it's really loud on the CPU, clearly nobody cares, keep doing it. Um, <laughs> on Linux, uh, you can pretty much just read from the device um, directly. Um, and uh, like I said, I do everything in Go, and the Windows one that I wrote when I was writing, when I started writing uh, Go implants for keylogs, I had to write manually. The Linux one, I literally just found. What's awesome is <laughs> this asshole. Um, it's not, it doesn't just work. Uh, it'll work for every device that's plugged into the system in real time. Like he made it all pretty. It's like a library. You can be like, I want all the devices, which is cool because when you pop a multi-user system, you'll get keylogs from like 20 different keyboards at once. Um, all right, I gotta speed up, I only got five minutes. Um, OSX, um, man, driver code on OSX is a fucking ass and a hat, man. Like, Coco sucks. Um, but this is how you do it. Like, you have to create like a, a key event for each key, and then when the key event gets called, you have to concat. Yeah, it's, God, it's a giant pain in the ass, but that's, this is how you do it. Like, if you go Google those words, you will get everything you need to know to write a key logger on, on uh, uh, Apple. Uh, so, I, actually, yeah, so here's, here's the code. This is literally like the smallest keylogger I could possibly write. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking Apple. Um, screen capture video. Um, so this is a manual way to do it uh, on Windows. Um, and I think I have, yeah, here's a, somebody else's solution that does it uh, on uh, OS X. But honestly, um, easy mode, go get OpenCV. It's huge, but it's not too huge, and it's static, and you just compile your exploit against it, or you, you compile your implant against it, and then ship it with your implant, and it works on fucking phones. <laughs> um, and it gives you all kinds of other stuff, like you can do video streaming, you can do image streaming, uh, it also totally works for uh, doing a camera grabs, um, which is cool, because depending on how fast the device is, even if you're on like an Apple device where the light will always turn on before the camera initializes, if you turn the camera on real fast, you'll still get the picture, and the light will never turn on. <laughs> Um, and, and as some of my friends will tell you, um, having a pen desk support with a picture of the person that was using the box when it got popped, oh my God, will get you money. <laughs> Turns out people shit the bed. Um, uh, WXD on Linux is actually really slow, but uh, it, it, it works. It's really effective because it tends to be uh, on anything with a GUI. Um, and a lot of times people aren't looking at manual resources. Uh, on Linux. Again, yeah, like OpenCV, use OpenCV. Um, this is, I'll scroll through it real quick, but again, these slides are going to get published and you can just copy pasta this code. Um, port audio. So if you want to hot mic something, don't mess with drivers. Go get port audio. It's multi platform and it works on everything. <laughs> like open device, cat to UDP shell. Yay! Uh, uh, here's an example of doing it. All right? It's fucking simple. Um, I'm going to skip through some of these because the rest of these are uh, like here's places to go to get um, things that will steal like browser data or auto keys or um, like Nursoft has a whole bunch of stuff. Unfortunately, a lot of their stuff is closed source, but use IDA, they don't pack. Um, on how to steal um, pretty much everything out of a browser. And you know, these days, like your life is in a browser. So uh, highly recommended. Um, email history is a great one. Um, I actually did this with Selenium. This is a cool little like auto, like, you know, you, you like pop something on somebody's system, wait till three in the morning and they're probably asleep, use Selenium, log into their Gmail account and make a backup of their shit and then send it to you. It's a great way to get data. Um, this was a specific payload that actually doesn't work anymore. I don't know why that slide is still in there, my bad. Um, uh, this is a backdooring, a backup file. This is a for like Exchange and for like email clients. Like basically take everything we said about the phone backup file, apply it to the email backup, totally works. Um, and these are all the path names on where Outlook stores its backup files. Um, and you can't really move them, turns out. And if you do move them, there's a registry key that gets populated with the fact that it's moved because the application is not prepared to handle the fact that it's moved. So you always know where it is. Um, again, NurseOff has tools to do this. Um, PCAP is cool. Um, yes, their stuff is closed source. Use IDA, they don't pack. Um, geolocation data is surprisingly useful because um, by looking at the context of somebody's machine in a given geo geolocation space, you can identify keys when keys are used and when Wi-Fi is used and you know, air gap stuff. It's useful. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip through some of this stuff because we're like way out of time. But these are all just you know completely um, canned solutions for 
you know, go get a thing, go get a thing and steal data. Um, okay, so event detection. So this is stuff I want. I kind of wanted to cover. Um, uh, so this is a oh, no. That's not what I was trying to get to. Okay, so stuff to show. So this is like this is my like general like reminder to be good at opsec, right? Like always make a way to self destruct in your shit because if you're caught, like you're going to be caught. It's an inevitability. Um, the best way that you can make sure your stuff is not analyzed is to dump it. If you were packed using runtime encryption, which we'll talk about later, um, during your transmission phase, if they didn't get you when you got in, they won't get you later. Just make sure your shit's gone. Um, the starfish arm attack is um, like a tactic where like say, okay, say you have like a Windows target and you have like you take the pool of uh, all the registry stuff that we talked about previously. Okay, so don't hide one, uh, don't use one of them, use them all and hide a different uh, DLL on a, in a different directory for each key and then when uh, the first time that one boots, look for the other one. If it's not there, add it back constantly. Totally works. Um, tripwire based removal, like I said, like build, you know, build in self destruct. And then the nuclear option is um, if you manage to get like questionably privileged access on a system and you find a really good TDOS bug or you know how to break the system, one option is if I get caught, nuke this box and destroy it. If it's a VM, fine, that'll come back, but it's the same operating context. You change your C2, you're good. If it's not, they're fucked. <laughs> um, Counter Intel, this is just, you know, again, like general advice things. Um, Changing, changing strings to Russian totally works. Changing strings to multiple languages makes them use other exploit kits. Another thing that's really cool is if you hash all the strings in a, a commercial malware variant that's on um, uh, virus total and add them into your malware, um, stuff will just look for the first string and immediately, oh, it's a variant of this, totally wrong. Um, uh, yeah, I was gonna go over some of like the Ebola stuff and life packing, but I'm out of time again, so I guess I will just post slides and call it a day. Um, Anybody got like one or two incredibly, incredibly fast questions? All right. Thanks. Buy me a beer.